Lord be with you. And also with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, You do not know now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, You will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, One who has bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him. For this reason he said, Not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, had put on his robe, and had returned to the table, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. Very truly I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the ones who sent them. The Gospel of Christ. Praise, Praise to you. Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know what I have done to you? We have no difficulty answering Jesus' question since the Gospel already puts the answer in our mouths. You've given us an example. You perform this menial task for your disciples and so we should be at one another's service in the same way. But by giving this ready-made answer, we can keep ourselves out of the push wash foot washing. We, after all, live in a shoe-wearing society, so to us, foot washing is a quaint Bible land custom, something that slaves and servants did. Most of us don't have servants. We have washing machines and showers and vacuum cleaners, and so this example has a kind of folkloric remoteness. We come to Monday, Thursday, while the coronavirus pandemic rages on, and as a result, we're not going to be anywhere near one another, let alone close enough to wash one another's feet. But let's take this opportunity to plunge into the depths of the symbol and not merely draw a lesson from its exemplary surface. What if we recall to ourselves what it means to be washed? To recall that with all our modern feelings and sensibilities we can begin to grasp what this might mean by asking ourselves, when was the last time we let someone else wash our body? What memories might that evoke? Some of you may be saying to yourselves, ah, the last time was when I was in love and we used to shower together. And others will be thinking, oh, I was so sick and sore in hospital and what a relief it was when the nurse came around to my bed and gave me a, a bed bath. How strange it was not to be able to help her, but how restorative it was, how, how refreshed I felt afterward. And others of us may have to ponder in our imaginations to some time before memory, with ourselves as little babies splashing our hands in the bath water as our mothers patiently sponged us down. Or perhaps that first bath after being born. Being washed is almost the first thing that ever happens to us, and it will be 
the last thing after we have died. Do you know what I have done to you? If we allow ourselves to go to the root of our experience of being washed, then we might cry out from our heart to Christ and answer his question, Yes, Lord, I know what you have done to me. In your death and resurrection, you are my new mother, giving me rebirth, new being. From you I emerge a new self, a new creation by water and the Spirit. Yes, Lord, I know what you have done to me. While I was yet helpless, at the right time, you died for me. When I was powerless to love, unable to heal myself, you became my healer and my nurse, cleansing away the sweat and grime of my folly and moral sickness, refreshing my fatigue and fever, invigorating my lassitude with love and forgiveness in the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Yes, Lord, I know what you have done to me. You have taken me to yourself in an embrace from which I shall never be thrust away. In the cross, having loved me who am in the world, you loved me to the end. Now it is I who am the beloved disciple. My place is always as close as it is possible to be, leaning upon your breast. Do you know what I have done to you? Christ has given us an example in his foot washing, but the example is just the tip of the iceberg. Beneath is the vast bulk and depth of meaning of what Christ has done for us in that self-giving to the uttermost. What Christ has done for us is as if each of us were the only man or woman in the world. The symbol and event that dominates the vastness of meaning is baptism. Baptism is an event done to us. No one can baptize herself or himself. Baptism is done to us to convey what Christ did to us while we were still helpless. Christ crucified and risen has given birth to us, to our new selves, reconciled us to the God of love. Christ has washed and healed our guilt. In his gospel, St. John expects us to search out the baptismal symbolism by picking up the clue of Peter's misunderstanding and Jesus' reply, Unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, One who is bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. These words make sense when we realize they're John's way of saying that baptism is our once and for all washing. We're clean all over unless, like Judas, we turn against Christ. But because of our baptism, we never need to start over again from nothing with Christ. We know what Christ has done for us, that he's taken us once and for all into his union with his Father and our Father, with his God and our God. But isn't it true that our need cries out to be met again and again? Isn't it true that day by day and week by week we need a fresh experience of our rebirth as new selves, that we need healing and cleansing from the grime and illness of today, that we need a renewed embrace of intimacy to solve our fear and separateness? Of course that's true. The washing of the feet is the symbol of that ever-repeated, ever new reactivation of Christ's self-giving that is the Eucharist. In his Gospel, John chooses not to describe the inauguration of the Eucharist at the Last Supper. Instead, he symbolizes it in the foot washing. He who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet. Those who have been baptized don't need to be baptized over again. They have been born again, and Christ is in them, and they are in Christ. But they do need to be served by Christ the servant, and they do need to let love re-envelop them and heal them and re-establish them. They need the Eucharist, which is the love available not just once, but again and again until the end. 
Do you know what I have done to you? We're living through a fast from the Eucharist for we don't know how long. But when next we're finally able to receive the Eucharist, let's look down at him at our feet and hear him ask us, do you know what I have done to you? Don't hide behind silence. Answer him. Tell him what you know. Christ, I know what you have done to me today, what you will do to me week after week. In this holy eating and drinking, you re-enter the bloodstream of my being. Unite yourself afresh with me. You nourish what is needful in me. You cleanse what is soiled. You embrace back to life my inmost self that halts and falters on its journey to fullness. You have given me yourself, and so, being found inseparable in you, I find myself in God and with God, where I belong. Do this in remembrance of me. This Monday Thursday evening we recall, we re-experience the first occasion on which these words were spoken by our Lord. This is my body given for you. This is my blood shed for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Over the past 2,000 years these words have been repeated literally billions of times in hundreds of languages around the world, probably every hour of every day somewhere, the Eucharist is being celebrated. And this evening I'd like to say something, first of all, about the very first occasion on which the Eucharist was shared by Jesus with his disciples in Jerusalem. What the disciples were expecting to have happen when they came literally what they brought to the table, I guess you could say, when they gathered together, what they were expecting would take place. But then we also discover how our Lord transformed this event into the total life-nourishing, life-sustaining sacrament in which we participate and are privileged to share. The Eucharist, or the service of Holy Eucharist, is also called Holy Communion, or the Mass, or the Lord's Supper. It has a different name in different traditions. But the common Eucharistic service is deeply grounded in the faith of Israel and in the narrative of the Old Testament. If you want to discover its origins, its roots, if you like, you should read the first chapters of the book of Exodus, the second book in the Old Testament, chapters 1 to 15. You may have a lot of time on your hands right now, and if you do, this would be a very good opportunity to enjoy this wonderfully told narrative, which is powerful and dramatic and very important still for us. It opens with the people of Israel, who are called the Hebrews by the Egyptians. The people of Israel are slaves in Egypt. They had come over 400 years ago as refugees welcomed into Egypt, the children and grandchildren of Jacob. But over the succeeding generations, they had become so powerful and so numerous that they posed a real threat to what you might call the Egyptian establishment, and in particular the pharaoh, the monarch or king of Egypt. And the pharaoh undertook to enslave them to deprive them of their rights and freedoms. And so as the story opens this morning, the Hebrew people are bound in slavery. And God calls Moses to lead these people out of bondage into freedom. And the first 11 chapters of the book of Exodus describe a series of conflicts between Moses and Pharaoh, or maybe God through Moses and Pharaoh. Uh, God says to Moses to speak to Pharaoh and say, let my people go. And so Moses does this, and Pharaoh says, I will not let your people go. And so a series of plagues as warning signs comes upon the people of Egypt. You probably are familiar with these plagues, especially if you watched the Ten Commandments, which was on 
I think it was Sunday night, Charlton Heston playing Moses. Anyway, that was a, a kind of a prelude to all this. But the plagues come in forms of uh, there's darkness, there's floods, there's locusts, there's frogs, there's all kinds of horrible things that happen. Every time the plague comes, the Pharaoh says, All right, I'll let your people go. So the plague is removed, Pharaoh changes his mind, and he says, I will not. Well, finally, and this is kind of the climax of the story in chapter 12, the most horrible devastation of all is prophesied that if he does not let the people go, the firstborn child of every Egyptian family will be put to death. The Pharaoh still refuses to let the Hebrews go. So, in preparation for this, Moses tells his people to put a sign of blood on the doorpost, the lintel in the doorpost of their home. Take some blood from a lamb, mark the lintels of their doorpost with that blood. That will signify that they are faithful members of the community of God. And the angel of death, when the angel comes, will pass over that family and spare the children. That's where the word for the festival comes, Passover. The Hebrew word is Pesach, but it means the same thing, pass over that family and spare them. And finally, God says, you will be allowed to go. All this indeed comes to pass, and the people of Israel are allowed to go, and they begin their journey to the Promised Land. Also in chapter 12, God says to the people of Israel that they are to keep the Pesach as a perpetual memorial of God's gracious act of freedom and of life, out of death and bondage into new life and new freedom. So there's a, a, a ritual set, if you like, beginning even before they left Egypt to make this a perpetual memorial. And Jewish families around the world ever since have been keeping Pesach. They will be keeping Pesach at this time, during this week as we meet up to Easter. The first ceremony in Pesach, now Passover has become a seven day event, it's really quite an elaborate festival, especially for Orthodox Jewish families, but the first event in Pesach is called the Seder meal. And we believe that this was the meal with which Jesus gathered together his disciples for the Seder meal. This is why they were coming together. The Seder meal itself is quite elaborate, probably a good deal more than it would have been in Jesus' time. It involves a number of different foods. Again, you can, if you like, you can Google it. It's wonderful what you can do on the Google. Uh, just Google Seder meal and you'll get all the explanations and details of what's involved. But the series really begins with a bunch of questions and answers. And the first question, which is often put by the youngest member of the family who are gathered. It's nice in this, in this situation as the youngsters who ask the old people for the stories and the advice, and that's the way it goes. And the child holds up a piece of unleavened bread, and a matzah, and says, what does this signify? And the senior member of the family begins to give the answer. This is the bread, the manna, with which your ancestors were fed during their time of affliction in the wilderness. That's the response. As the meal goes on, actually the wine is drunk on four different occasions, it's quite the celebration. But wine signifies, among other things, the successful completion of the journey. When the Israelites were traveling through the wilderness, they couldn't possibly plant vineyards and harvest grapes and make wine. Well, that was not possible for them. But once they landed in the Promised Land, took possession of it, they were able to establish themselves with the vineyards and the grapes and the wine. So wine became a kind of symbol of the successful completion of that journey. Now Jesus, on this first Eucharistic event, takes the bread and says, this is my body. He takes the wine and says, this is my blood. Jesus puts himself at the center of the great saving acts of God. I am the means by which you will be brought out of slavery, slavery to this world, slavery to sin, fear, fear of death, into freedom, 
and the promise of eternal life. This is how we as Christian communities have come to understand that first Eucharist. I think it's fair to say that on that evening, the disciples who were with him would not have had the slightest idea what he was talking about. How could they possibly understand at that point? It's significant. They don't say anything. They don't get involved in the conversation. I think they're just overwhelmed with what is said at that time. But it's something which has been given through them to us. Certainly very early in the life of the Christian Church, shortly after the resurrection, when the Christian churches were being established, these words, and we call them the words of institution, you may have heard that, it means the words by which the Eucharist was begun or instituted. These words of institution were repeated at liturgies. Only a dozen or so years after Jesus' earthly ministry, St. Paul, in writing to the Corinthians, quotes this passage, these words of institution, as something already established in the liturgy of the Church. And ever since that time, the two great sacraments of the baptism, the initiation into the Christian community, and the Eucharist are being sustained in the Christian community, have been the defining events of Christian worship. Now, as to what actually happens to the bread and the wine when Jesus says, this is my body and this is my blood, as you may know, these are, have been matters of great discussion, you might say debate, and even, I'm sorry to say, division in different parts of the Christian community. I don't have either the competence or the time to go into all the details of exactly what we understand by this, but I am going to tell you what I believe. This is what I believe, and I... I am confident that this comes from within the tradition of the Anglican Christian faith. I believe that when I receive the consecrated bread and wine, I am truly receiving the body and blood of the risen Lord. I believe also that the bread and the wine physically remain bread and wine, they don't change their chemical properties, put it that way, but they become the means of receiving the risen Lord into my heart, into my life, into my being. Our Lord nourishes me in this world with courage, fortitude, hope, strength, and love. Our Lord also sustains me on the journey through this world to the world of God's kingdom, the world of eternal life. So it's a journey sustained here and now and a journey sustained forever. One of the great sorrows of our time now, in which we are experiencing physical isolation and other forms of isolation as well during the time of this virus, one of the great sorrows for me, and I'm sure for many of you, is that we are not able to share physically in the Eucharist, either on a daily or weekly basis, and particularly at Easter. But we can be sustained by the hope that we will meet again, by the knowledge that we will meet again, and that we will appreciate perhaps even more fully uh, the great mystery in which we are privileged to participate. I'd like to conclude by reading for you one of the great Eucharistic hymns by the 13th century poet and theologian Thomas Aquinas. This is an English translation of it, but it's a particularly beautiful hymn. You can, uh, again, you can Google it. All you have to do is Google the first line, Thee we adore, O hidden Savior, Thee. If you Google that, you'll get both the words and also the tune by which we commonly know it. But I'm going to read it now for you. In the first verse, the Christian approaches the sacrament and thinks about it. The second verse refers to the bread, the third verse to the wine, and in the final verse, the poet looks forward to the time when we will see Christ unveiled fully and clearly in the kingdom of heaven. Thee we adore, O hidden Saviour, Thee, who in this sacrament dost deign to be. 
Both flesh and spirit at thy presence fail, yet here thy presence we devoutly hail. O blessed memorial of our dying Lord, who living bread to us doth here afford, O may our souls forever feed on thee, and thou, O Christ, forever precious be. Fountain of goodness, Jesu, Lord and God, cleanse us unclean with thy most cleansing blood. Increase our faith and love, that we may know the hope and joy which from thy presence flow. O Christ, whom now beneath the veil we see, may what we thirst for soon our portion be, to gaze on thee unveiled and see thy face, the vision of thy glory. 